right, so Revelation chapters 4 and 5 is kind of our... They go together, although we're not reading both of them at the same time, just because they're all part of the same kingdom vision. As we talked about last week, they're snapshot visions that are visions that kind of come in, they punctuate the book of Revelation. Uh, you find them all the way throughout, so you've had the letters to the Ecclesia, then you get a, a, punctuation, a punctuation, so to speak, that is, that is a kingdom vision, a snapshot vision of the kingdom, and then you go on, you look at the next section, which is like the seals, and then you have another vision, and it goes all the way through the book of Revelation like that. So this is one of those visions, and we looked at last week um, this whole idea of the heavenlies, and we kind of circled around on that. We looked at it before um, quite a while ago, um, but we kind of wanted to just re-bring our minds back because chapters 4 and 5 are all set in the time period of the rulership of the kingdom of God. I'm going to look at that a little bit more and develop that out as we go through more of this chapter tonight. So, again, we have a little bit of background. We had the idea of the door being opened in heaven, or in the heavenly. So we talked about the fact that the heavens are closed to us right now. It's not our place to rule at this point in time. And as we read last week, uh, Brother Thomas said, like, that is below us. Uh, to get involved in the politics of the day because in order to get involved in the politics of the day, then you have to basically drop yourself to the level of the masses and try and appeal to the basest of men um, in order to get enough people on side and offer them whatever they want so that they will vote you in. Um, that is not how we operate. We're, we're looking to please God and not men. So coming in then to this next little part then, he says that he hears the first voice which I heard, as it were a trumpet, talking with me. So he hears this first voice. We want to just kind of hone in on that for a little bit. So Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. And it's the, he's talking about the first voice, something that's already been introduced to us. And it's the voice of a trumpet. So we want to go back to where it first comes up, and that's Revelation chapter 1 in verse 10, and this is where we get that first voice. So if you think about where we've been, Revelation chapter 1 was the vision of the man of one. During that vision, you had this, this multitudinous Christ that would be there, that would um, develop, and we went through all the different pieces of that. And then you had that voice, or that man of one, talking with John and reciting to him or giving him the letters that would be given to the Ecclesias. Now in chapter 4, he's making reference back to the man of one in chapter 1, saying the first voice that I heard, is it was talking with me, and it's the voice of a trumpet. So whoever was next, if you could read Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Okay, so he's on, in a spirit on the Lord's day, and we spent a class a while ago looking at the Lord's day and what that means, and he sees, or hears, behind him, which would tell you that this is something that's in the past, and it's the voice of a trumpet. So the trumpet is behind him. It's something that's taken place in the past. Okay? So it's just important for us to kind of get our orientation to what's going on here. We say, well, what is this trumpet that he's heard behind him? And of course, this is the resurrection trumpet. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we're going to start here and probably end here tonight if we get all the way through our material, which we may or may not, which is fine if we don't, but 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and um, we want to just kind of plug in what this means, and it's verses 42 to 44. 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it is raised in corruption. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. So here he says he's talking about the resurrection of the dead. And he makes reference to a spiritual body. Right? And remember what John says here. 
He is in spirit on the Lord's day, right? So that spiritual body and the idea of being in spirit goes together, right? So when he's talking about being in spirit, as we looked at the other day, this is spirit nature. And we're going to come back and look at that a little bit more when we look at the ascending side of this. But it's the spirit nature. So this is John being transported in time, right, to somewhere in the future where behind him the resurrection is taking place. And he's in spirit, and it's on the Lord's day. So it's in spirit nature, on the Lord's day, with the resurrection behind him. And that's the only way, of course, that John could be in spirit nature. But you have the voice of the trumpet, which is verses 51 down to verse 53. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. If you could read that for us, Fred, that would be great. Can't be. Oh, you don't have your glasses? Okay. Ariel, you're on deck. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So there you have it. We're changed, which is causing, talking about in nature, when the trumpet sounds. Right? So you have there the resurrection trumpet. The voice of the trumpet is behind him, so it's in the past. And that's when our nature is changed, and we will no longer need spectacles, because we will be immortal at that point in time, and all those types of issues will be gone. No hearing aids, no spectacles, no canes, yeah. all of that. Our youth will be renewed like the eagles, and all the maladies that we have will be gone away. We will be in spirit nature. Yeah, that is something to look forward to. So, this is the, the context of where we are in Revelation chapter 4. So, it's just important to get that in our, in our minds. We are post resurrection, after the judgment, when he is changed in nature to become spiritual uh, man, immortalized, right? So, so just whenever you're thinking of Revelation chapter 4 and 5, because people get very confused with it as to what it's all about, and who's the people on the throne and what's going on, because they miss the point of when it happens. They try to put it back around AD 96 or 70 or whatever they think it might be, and then it all gets muddled up. This is a vision that is transported into the future, and John is in the future. The resurrection's behind him. He's now in spirit nature. So that's just, when we talk about revelation, we're going to do this a lot. It's a stage for a play, right? Mm -hmm. And there's characters that are going to come onto the stage, and characters are going to come off the stage. But it's important that we get the setting, the scene where things are going on. So if you think of when you're in a play in school or Sunday school or whatever it might be, you know, you got act one, scene one, you know, so-and-so does such and such, the trees all come in, Jericho's there, and you have your setting. You understand that when people are marching around this block of cardboard bricks, that they're marching around Jericho, and, and we get that setting, right? So it kind of takes us that time. And sometimes the narrator of the play or whatever it might be will give you a little bit of that background so that when you see the activity that's going on and the action, the animation, you recognize that this is what it's symbolizing. Even though the little kids dragging their little dollies around the cardboard boxes, you know, you might need, it leaves a lot to the imagination at times. If you get that context, you can then pick up the pieces and see it. Well, that's like the book of Revelation. We're putting it into context. The context is post-resurrection. Now, we just want to come back to Revelation chapter 1. And... Um, because we're going to really hone in on the trumpet, really, is, is probably our main theme for tonight. So, Revelation chapter 1 and verses 12 to 13. Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 to 13. And we want to read here about what John is seeing. Remember, um, this is the same voice in Revelation 1 that we have in Revelation chapter 4, right? This is the first voice that talked with him. So this is a character we've already seen. 
It's coming back on the scene, and it's introducing us to what's going on. So Revelation chapter 1, in verses 12 to 13. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and a girt about the paps with a golden girdle. So when he turns to see the voice, it's one like the Son of Man, which, if you remember from Daniel, was called the Man of the One. Right? And Uncle Paul was talking about this on the, in the exhortation on Sunday um, when we were talking about Habakkuk, right? How that there was this certain man, this man of one, um, that was being referenced there. So that's what John is looking at, which, of course, is the resurrected, multitudinous Christ. That is what he is looking at. Now, it's important that we kind of just pull all those things together. So we spent, I think it was two years ago, a whole series of classes looking at um, the man of one and all the symbology that was involved in that. And now we're looking at John conversing with this multitudinous Christ that's been raised. Now, if you were to kind of try and rationalize this from a, a human point of view, John is talking with himself. And it just doesn't make any sense, right? Like if you were trying to sort of like put it together. But when you put it into spiritual language, John's transported to the kingdom age and he's talking with the multitudinous body of Christ, of which he is a part, right? But so he's seeing and he's interacting with a system of things that's in the future after the resurrection. So let's just go and, and see how this takes place. We've looked at this before, but just to kind of bring us back together, Isaiah 26 in verse 19. This is this resurrected multitudinous Christ. Isaiah 26 in verse 19. And I'm going to get you to read it twice. Once with everything in it, and then once just ignore the italics. Okay, Josiah? <laughs> So we read the first time through, just like it is. Second time, anything that's in italics, you're not going to read it. All right. Thy dead men shall live together with my dead body, shall they arise. Awake and sing, and dwell in dust. For thy dew is as the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Okay, so there's the first time around. Now let's read it without the italics. Thy dead shall live together, my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in dust. For thy dew, the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out the dead. Close. Thy dead shall live, my dead body shall they arise. Now the translators when they read that, couldn't make hide nor hair of it, so they had to throw in, together with my dead body shall they arise. Because they didn't understand that this was actually speaking about um, the multitudinous body of Christ because they believe in the Trinity, not in God manifestation. Yes, Ed? Uh, just a question for Isaiah 26 and 19. The King James has the italics. Correct. I in my ESV, there is no italics. There is no italics, right. Right, because it's a little bit closer to the original text. And, and it's what the ESV I got when with the King James when I looked at it to read it first. It was very confusing. So then I decided I'm going to go look it up on my ESV to see what the difference is. Yeah. And to, to what I can see is that um, all, all of us when we dead shall live when it comes to the kingdom. Right, so the dead are going to live, but the point is... They're going to be resurrected before at the, for our judgment. Yes. But it's this little phrase here, my dead body <coughs> shall they arise. They say, well, whose body is it? Yeah. It's the body of Christ. The ones so, that are baptized into him? Right. So when we talk about the ecclesia, right, it's the body of Christ. So this is what's being resurrected. So it's like 
the team, I guess, is a way you could look at it. Like, if you think of, like, um, I don't know what team, I'm not really good with teams, but like, let's say the Blue Jays, right? <laughs> so let's say the Blue Jays, right? You, you don't look at them as individuals, usually. It's the team. You look at the, the, the whole thing, because if you only had a pitcher, well, what's the point? Because if he throws the ball and the guy hits it, and nobody's out there to catch, then it's not going to work, right? You need all the sum of the parts, right? Mm -hmm. So, and the same thing is here, is that this is his dead body that they are arising as a collective. All of them are a part of this body. It's like when I go to, for work, right, and I'll go somewhere and I'll say, well, you know, um, I'm Jonathan, I'm from Victor Web Printing, and they'll phone upstairs to say, you know, whoever the client is, Mr. Client, you know, Victor Web Printing is here. Well, Victor Web Printing didn't literally, like, you know, lift up bricks, mortar, 60,000 square foot of factory and 100 people and all come running down the street and plonk on the lawn. I represent it, right? So that's the idea here is that we are all parts of the, the corporate body of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's, and that's actually the phrasing Brother Thomas used, I think it's in Anastasis, where he talks about the corporate body, right? So it's, it's the whole group. And that's what's happening here, is they're being resurrected as a whole group. The worldwide ecclesia. The worldwide ecclesia, that's right. And there is only one body. Um, it's not like there's, there's many different bodies. There's one body. And we're all members of that. Now we have factions in that body, like different groups, and we put names on them, and we actually call them fellowships and whatnot, which is not really a correct biblical term, um, because there is only one body. Um, we just, as human beings, have kind of messed it up royally um, over the years for different reasons, and um, different factions have developed, and... What we've got to recognize is when you come to this point in time, all of that disappears. It's all over with. It's all a thing of the past. And um, our involvement in this is going to be dependent on how we have behaved in this life. Now, I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about these trumpets. Because if you're like me, you've heard it said that the judgment is going to take a period of 10 years. Right? You probably heard that said that, that over um, the judgment is going to take about 10 years to happen. And I always used to think, well, that's a very long time. Um, I don't really get why um, Brother Thomas would say that in why others would kind of follow along with this theory that the judgment is going to be a 10 year period. Interestingly, he doesn't actually refer to it in this section in Eureka, and he might get into it somewhere else. But this is the section where, for the first time, I actually understood why he said it. Um, and it. And it really makes kind of sense. Because remember, this is the trumpet blowing, right? So this is the phrasing that we're into, or that the section we're into, is the time of the trumpet. Now, it's interesting, um, because there's some real sort of, um, how would I put it? If you follow the time period through, there's implications that come out of this. And we're going to kind of look at those tonight. And it depends how far we get. So let's go back. It's the call of the trumpet, right? So the dead rise, right? So the dead rise with the call of the trumpet. They are prisoners in the grave. But the call of the trumpet is going to release them from the bonds of death. So let's go back to when the first of those trumpet calls is made under the law of Moses and kind of see if we can establish some context with this. Yes. Leviticus 23 in verse 24. So this is the context then under the law. Leviticus 23 verse 24. And we want to just read... Um, when the trumpets were blown in Israel's history and see if we can extract out of that any lessons. And i got to say, like, you know, um, this is the first time that I really kind of got my head around this. Um, I mean, before I would listen to Uncle Tom, John Thomas, I think, you know, I'm sure he's got his reasons for what he says, but I could never really figure it out and I couldn't come up with the, here's the point. Well, this is where that point comes up. So... Leviticus 23, 24, whoever's next. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying in the seventh month, 
in the first day of the month shall ye have a Sabbath and a memorial of blowing of trumpets and holy convocation. Okay, so it's the seventh month. It's the first day of the month. You're going to have a blowing of trumpets. And it's a holy convocation. That's what's going on here. A holy convocation, this blowing of trumpets that's taking place. Okay, so that's really interesting. What was taking place during this time? Numbers chapter 10, verses 2 to 4. So we're kind of stringing together bits of the law that all talk about this. Numbers chapter 10, verses 2 to 4. Have you, Lori, at the back? Already. Almost there. Okay. Two silver trumpets. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Make two silver trumpets for yourself. You shall make them of hammered work. You shall use them for calling the congregation and for directing the movement of the camps. Keep going. How, where do you want me to go to four? Yeah. Okay. When they blow both of them, all the congregation shall gather before you at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. But if they blow only one, then the leaders, the head of the divisions of Israel, shall gather to you. Okay, so if one is blown, it's the calling of the congregation together. If two, or sorry, that's if two are blown. If one is blown, it is for the heads or the princes to gather. Okay, so that's what this blowing of the trumpets is all about. They're to gather to the tabernacle, the door of the tabernacle, um, and the congregation, the princes, the heads of the thousands will gather themselves, okay? So that's what is taking place here. Um, it's the gathering of the princes, the heads of the congregation. Now, does that ring any bells or blow any trumpets for you? Wouldn't that be from earlier in classes from the... The uh, cliches that we did in earlier revelations. In the, in it's actually 10. going back even before that. We're going back into Daniel. Daniel 9. It's uh, Daniel 8, actually. It's, it's one of the titles of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're gathering together here the princes. Commander of commanders? Commander of the commanders. Let's go there. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25. Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25. And through his policy also he shall cause the craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall he destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without him. Okay, so here he is. He's against the prince of princes, which is the commander of commanders. And we've got to put that into, what does that mean? Well, the commander is Christ of the commanders, which is the saints, of the commanded, which would be the Jews, Israel. Right? Because if you remember, Matthew 19, 24 and 25, to you is given to sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So they're going to command the 12 tribes of Israel, but over those commanders, there is a commander, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember his title in the book of Revelation? He is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Well, we're called to be kings and priests, but he's the king of all the kings. 
And we're called to be lords in the kingdom age, ruling over the nations, but he is the lord of the lords, right? The commander of the commanders. So this is a trumpet that was to call the commanders together, right? The princes together. I'm just plugging that into Daniel chapter 8 and verse 25. And just incidentally, um, interestingly enough, that he's going to come and judge the nations, the great horn and whatever else, and it's going to be broken, he says, without hand, which we've looked at in the past, is like what? What does that remind you of? Something broken without hand. What was without hand? The image, right? What was made? The stone was made without hand, right? Which smote the image. So again, this is not a human force. This is a spirit-natured force. And this is why, remember, John is called up to the heavens, and he is given spirit nature. He comes in spirit. So it's not like this is mankind, right? Just human beings. This is people of spirit nature that have been created by the word of God working on their minds and their hearts. So, when you look at that, and you say, okay, well, this is interesting, um, because we actually have parallels to this, this gathering of the commanders in the book of Revelation. So, let's go to Revelation chapter 7 and verse question? 9. There's Are no you such saying thing as a silly question. commander of commanders, because prince of princes, how it's written, is actually a Hebrew word, is commander? Yes. Okay. Yeah, the, the prince of princes translated okay. is <laughs> commander of commanders. Okay. Yeah. That is, the, uh, that is what the meaning of the word is. So, Revelation chapter 7, in verse 9. And again, we're just looking at this idea of a trumpet blows, and that gathers together the commanders, right? Kingdom time. So, let's take a look at that one. Revelation chapter 7, and verse 9. After this I beheld, and though a great multitude, which no man could number of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So here you have the commanders assembled. A great multitude of all the nations are before the Lamb. <coughs> Right? So they've been gathered together. This is the, the process that has been taking place. Right, They're gathering together and they're clothed with white robes. So this is the saints. Because the white linen is the righteousness of the saints. Okay, So let's add to this another passage. Revelation chapter 11 in verses 18 to 19. And again, I appreciate we're not going in and, and sort of looking at the context of all of these. We're just trying to gather the theme together. We'll circle back and look at chapter 7 and look at chapter 11 uh, later on, but I just want you to kind of get the, the essence of what's taking place here. So Revelation chapter 11, verses 18 to 19. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants the prophets, to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and just destroy them which destroy the world, the earth, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in this temple the ark of His testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Okay, so here you have again, similar theme. You've got saints that are being gathered together, right? The time of the dead, right? Uh, the way it phrases it there, that they should be judged. And they're given their reward. It's servants, prophets, saints, those who fear his name. That's the group of people that are gathered together here. And they're small and great. And then it says that the temple of God was opened in heaven. So again, you have this opening up of the heavens, right? Because the people who are judged worthy will ascend into the heavens and will become the rulership of the future kingdom age. And there's going to be these lightnings and voices and thunders and an earthquake and hail. So then you're going to have judgment that's going to follow. But before the judgment of the nations, you have the judgment of the household that is taking place here, right? So this is the resurrection that is going to precede the judgment of the world. So one last passage, 
Um, Revela- or Second Thessalonians chapter two, um, and this is uh, in context of the judgment of the great harlot system, or the man of sin, I guess you could say. But I just want you to notice the phrasing here. So again, we're not going to look at the whole chapter. We're just picking up some of the threads. Second Thessalonians chapter two, and at verse one. I will read one and two. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered together to him, we ask you, brothers, not to be quick, shaken in mind, or alarmed either by a spirit, or a spoken word, or a letter seeming to be formed from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. So pick out the three elements there. You have the coming of Christ, our gathering um, together unto him, right? So there you've got the gathering together for what is going to be the day of the Lord. And remember where we started off in Revelation, right? When we were looking at John speaking about Take, going up to the heaven, and it's the day of the Lord. I was in spirit on the Lord's day, right? On the day of the Lord. This is the, the same context of what's going on here. And all these events are coming together. So now we want to just look at the time period of this, because it's quite fascinating, really, when you take the law and what it has to say and combine it with what we've been looking at here. So you've got the... Um, the whole concept of this, the seventh month of the first day, there's a blowing of the trumpets, right? That is the gathering of the rulers together, right? So I'm going to leave the first passage up there um, simply because it helps establish our context of the timeline. And turn, if you would, to the next one, which is Leviticus 25. And verse 9. Leviticus chapter 25 and verse 9. Then shalt thou cause the Then shalt thou the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land. Okay, so the true belief trumpet is going to sound, right, when? It's the seventh month, and this time, it's the tenth day, okay? So the seventh month and the tenth day is when the jubilee trumpet's going to sound. What is that day? It's Yom Kippur, the day of covering or the Day of Atonement, right? That's when this is going to be. So the first trumpet, so let's just take a a timeline here and kind of just map this out. So day one is the gathering, and then you have day 10 is covering. For atonement. Now, Brother Thomas simply uses the principle that we use elsewhere in the Bible, and we'll just we'll give you a couple of examples of this. Ezekiel chapter four, I think it is, in verse seven. Ezekiel has to stay on his side, it's verse six. Ezekiel Chapter 4 and verse 6, right? A day equals a year. One day equals one year. That's the, uh, you know, my brother James just doesn't get it in his head. Monday night. Revelation class. 
Okay. <laughs> so. Wrong side of the country. Wrong side. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 6, a day represents a year. So how long is it from the gathering to the time when the atonement is completed? Ten years. Ten, ten years. years. Ten years. That's why Brother Thomas says, ten years for judgment. Now, I don't know why I missed that for the last 35 years, but somehow I did. You know, but there you go. That's where he bases it on, the ten years for judgment. It's not just a number that he pulled out of the sky. He's basing it on the blowing of the trumpets. That basically, the gathering takes place here, the princes, the commanders, and then ten days later, it's the Day of Atonement. So the resurrection, the gathering of the man of one together, and ten days later is going to be their actual immortalization or their covering when their atonement is made complete, right? Because Kippur simply means to cover, right? So that's the principle or that's the, that's the scriptures on which he's basing his ten-year judgment. So that's where this whole period comes from. And I've got to confess, I must be thick because I missed it all these years. So ten years of judgment. It takes us a whole lifetime to put the Bible all in perspective. From beginning to end. Yes. Yeah, well, and you know what? It's a continual process, process right. right? You build upon stuff as you go. And sometimes you just got to slow down a little bit. And maybe I read this before and just never absorbed it. Um, but there's the principle right there. Now, when you look at that and you say, okay, well, if um, we were to, to look at this and to, to sort of digest this just a little bit and say, what would be um, this whole situation like? Let's just take a look at the gathering for one moment. Um, Thessalonians, let's go back there. Because some have ruminated that maybe the dead will be raised ahead of us. Um, one thing we know for certain, in, in Hebrews, we're told, they without us will not be made perfect. So we are all immortalized together on the tenth day, so to speak, right? So that's when this takes place. But uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 4, and let's just read verses 15 to uh, 18. 2 Thessalonians 4, there is no 2 Thessalonians. Uh, sorry, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 18. I'm just awake. I'm just with it yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Can't keep up with you. Verses 15 to 18. <laughs> he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. <laughs> <laughs> this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. That we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. So here you have the pattern. You have the Lord descending from heaven. He comes with a shout. He comes with the voice of the angel. And there's the trump, right? And the dead rise first. So that's the first event. So the resurrection is going to precede everything else that's going to happen. So you have the Lord descending. The resurrection trumpet sounds, and the dead are then raised to life. Then he says, we which are alive and remain shall be taken away, or snatched away. So those who are alive, so there's the dead. Then you have those that are alive are going to be taken with them. Essence is going. Right? So it's not like 
we're going to be watching this on CNN, uh, we're taken together with them. That's the way the situation goes. So, and then we're going to notice what he says, meet the Lord in the heavenlies, right? So that's the next step. I mean, he's missing out judgment in here. He hasn't got into that. He's just kind of giving us an overview, right? But notice that you've got the dead rise first, and then we which are alive and remain are taken with them. Now, just my own thoughts on this, and this is by no means something that I would be dogmatic about, um, but just something to kind of ruminate. Sometimes it's good to think about these things. Like, how will this whole situation take place? But if you take a look at when the Lord Jesus Christ came um, the first time around, and you come back to, Reve or to uh, and I'm just going to find the right passage here. Um, One will be grinding and the other will be taken. That's all I don't think it We just read it, actually. Okay, it's John chapter 20. And verse 19 and um, 20. John 20, verses 19 and 20. John 20, verses 19 to 20. I don't know where we got up to and who's going to fight same. over then the same day at even, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had, had said so, he showed, them, he showed unto them his hands at, and his side. Then were, they, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Okay, so now you just sort of set the scene for this. It's the first day of the week. Well, what are we talking about here? It's the seventh month and it's the first day. There's a blowing of trumpets. The saints are gathered together in one place. Where are they here? They're in an upper room. What are they doing? They're actually having a breaking of bread. That's sort of the context of what's going on here. That's what they did on the first day of the week, is they had a breaking of bread, right? So they, they follow what he commanded them back in Luke, this do ye in remembrance of me. So, in my mind, you think about, well, how is this going to happen? And you have all of the, you know, people being snatched out of their cars, and the cars going careening off the road, and all these crazy evangelical movies and whatever else, the Left Behind series and whatever, and all that idea of, you know, just pop, you know, you disappear, and your clothes are all neatly folded, sitting on the chair kind of thing, and you're gone, you know. I always wondered if that was the case. What if you know, you were resurrected instantaneously and there had been a heart <coughs> transplant and somebody's walking around with your heart and now all of a sudden you're resurrected. Does that mean that they die of a sudden massive heart disappearance? Like, or how does that work, right? So obviously, the way God is going to work is not the way man would look at things. He works usually through natural means. So usually on a Sunday, the first day of a week, the saints gather together to the hall and their meeting in the breaking of bread, remember him until he come. And then one day he does. So while we're all sitting there, and you know, usually it's somebody coming in late, we won't say who, but you know, um, they come in late on a Sunday morning, and usually they got little kids and you know, whatever else, and everybody likes to rubberneck it and see, well, who's late this week, you know, which one of the family is at this time. And they all turn around and they have a look, but instead of the usual suspects coming in, it's the brothers and sisters who have long since fallen asleep, all filing into the hall. Because the angel has come, the resurrection trumpet has sounded, the dead in Christ have been risen first. They're then gathered together with us. Well, what better time to do it than we're all gathered together in one place? We which are alive and remain, we're taken together then with them to meet the Lord. 
right? And to me, that's more what's logical. I'm not saying it has to be on a Sunday morning, but it just seems to be a logical occurrence, right? That when we're gathered together, because it kind of fits the pattern of this, the, the trumpet sounding and the gathering of the saints, that then we're going to be taken together to meet the Lord. And it begs the question, what if I wasn't there on that Sunday? Now the angel has to go recoup me from whatever activity I found to be more important than what he wants me to do, <coughs> right? So you just got to start, I, I try to think about these things and ask the question. But basically, the saints are then gathered together and they're brought to the place of judgment, which of course we know to be in Sinai. Yes, Ed? To go with what you're saying, what if you were doing something, for example, towards his works? Well, it's Wait, totally different. He's still come and find you to bring you to Oh, absolutely. Judgment. He's going to come find you no matter right? what, whatever yeah. you're doing. Okay. Even if you're doing something totally wrong, he's still going to come get you. Mm -hmm. You but just then, then when you th might when not you feel so good when yeah. he shows up and goes, excuse me, um, mm -hmm. come with me. You know what I mean? Like, or, so it's, uh, it's just what we, we have to think about. Where are we going to be? Where are you in Australia, you know, 18 hours, 6 hours later, <laughs> when you get the call? Yeah. You know? Yeah. We, we you know, it's probably on to that global clock thing. Can't. Well, I was just wondering, would, he, would it be a benefit for us when, it, when that time comes, if we're doing his works by teaching to someone outside the truth that's more oh. learning, and the judgment comes at the same time? No, absolutely. Uh, what I'm referring to more, Ed, is like, what if we were doing something completely useless? Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, it's just something to just think about. You know, like, what do we do on our Sundays if we're just doing whatever, and we just felt like we'd sleep in that day or something like that? Um, you got to ask the question, what the Lord came on that day, and his commandment was simply just, you know, gather together, remember me, not forsaking the assembling of together of yourselves as the manner of some is, but so much more the so as you see that day approach, right? That's Hebrews tells us that. So as the day gets closer, we should be more intent on gathering together, recognizing that at any moment the call is going to come and we're out of here. We're all taken together to meet the Lord and to be part of that judgment process. Now, I'm going to leave this chart up here. Um, I'm going to take a photo before I erase everything. Um, I want you to think about, though, just the, the implications of this on a couple of levels. So we're going to be taken away. Well, first of all, let me just throw a couple of verses in there for our younger friends who are with us tonight so they don't get terrified here that they're going to be left behind or what what happens to me okay um, let's just think about that because I think it's a very valid one that's actually something that Laurie and I talked about in our kitchen table in Paris when I had little one-year-olds and two-year-olds that are now married and moved there. Um, but anyway uh, let's go to Daniel and chapter then this is important like when we think these things through we talk about them but you've got to think about how this affects us. Daniel chapter 10. Little minds sit in our meetings and they, they think things like this. Little kids. Daniel oh, 10. Glenn gets really nervous sitting beside Mariah. <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> because he said to me the other day, where do you think she is teaching Sunday school? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Daniel 10. She's with it. And um, let's just read verse 12. Verse 12. Yes. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand yeah. and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. I remember that, chat. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. So here's the criteria. From the moment... And notice what he says here. You set your heart to understand. Number one. I remember that when I was 12 years old. And number two, chasten yourselves. So what that means is not only do you want to know what God wants you to do, but you're also now trying to conform your life to it. So your friends at school might be doing this and that and the other, but you're saying, well, I can't do that because I've been called to be part of the kingdom of God, and this is what God wants me to do. So I'm not going to go chasing all those things. So 
It's from the moment that you set your heart, you say in your mind, I want to know what God wants me to do, and you begin that process. It doesn't mean you're going to run out and get baptized tomorrow, but you begin the process of thinking about what is it that God wants me to do from that moment, and then you chasten yourself. So you start to conform yourself to what he wants you to do. Notice what he says. From that moment, your words are heard. Now, if you think about this, you say, okay, so what happens then? Take a look at the children of Israel. Remember Pharaoh? When Moses first came to Pharaoh and says, let my people go that they may serve thee, right? Moses says, okay, the men folk can go. And not Moses, Pharaoh says the men can go, right? And God says, no, not good, not good enough. He wouldn't leave the women and the children, in fact, he wouldn't even leave the cattle behind. I'm not saying that Sketch is coming too, but like, um, but he wouldn't even leave the cattle behind. Like, he absolutely didn't work that way. You think of when the angel came to Lot in Sodom, right? He says, do you have anybody here? He says, go get your, wife, your, your daughters. If you've got sons-in-laws, go get them, or sons. Go to anybody that will listen, right? And so Lot goes out, and he goes, and he tries to reason with his kids, and they don't want to know. They think he's a, he's a fool, right? But he, he goes through the motion of trying to, to convince them to bring them along, but they don't want to bar of it, right? But yet his two daughters that do live with him, the angels take them by the hand, and they linger, and, you know, and like, you know, we often think of Lot's wife. Remember what the Lord Jesus Christ says, remember Lot's wife, right? She looked back. I used to think, like, you know, she's probably thinking of her, you know, uh, kitchen that she just put in and the nice tiles and all this kind of stuff and whatever it else it was at the home that she was thinking about. And then, like, you know, as you get older and maybe you think, probably she was thinking, I've got children and grandchildren, and that's probably what maybe she was thinking about a little bit more. Maybe it was just the, the, the you know, the, the lifestyle that they had, but she had family in that city. And so she turned back, right? God doesn't want to leave anybody behind. He's not willing that any should perish. He's not trying to keep us out of the kingdom. He's trying to get us into the kingdom. So he's not going to leave behind our kids or our families. We are sanctified. The children are sanctified by the parents. So they are taken with them. Now, if I can put my finger on it, I might not be able to because I wasn't really planning on talking on this, but these things happen sometimes. Um... Isaiah 56, let's go there. So what happens, let's say, to our young people who are not baptized, but are still heading in that direction, um, are they going to get left behind? And the answer is emphatically no. Um, Isaiah 56, verses 6 to 7. I'm just going to write it on the board just as a cross-reference. Isaiah 56 and verses 6 and 7. I can't remember where we got up to. Also the sons of the stranger that join themselves to Yahweh to serve him, and to love the, the name of the Lord, to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it, and taketh hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon my altar. For my house shall be called in house of prayer for all people. So pick that up. Who is he talking about? Whose sacrifices are accepted? Ours. Read it again. Strangers. Well, sons of strangers. It's the yeah. sons of the strangers yeah. who join themselves to me. Now we would be the strangers. We're the, the Goyim, the Gentiles, who join ourselves to Yahweh, right? Our children's sacrifices are going to be accepted, right? Notice what he says there. The sons of the strangers that join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and love his name and uh, to be his servants, to keep the Sabbath and, and take hold of his covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. So it's the children of the saints who will be taken to Jerusalem, 
and will be basically adopted into the nation of Israel and will have the opportunity in the kingdom of God to be part of that mortal population that will go up and that their sacrifices will be accepted. Right? So, just when we, when we look at that, basically, actually I should have probably wrote, written those things up here, but the moment that we, we set our hearts, I'm going to move it, I remember what it was then there for. So, Isaiah 56, verses 6 to 7, it's the sons of the strangers. Would that also, could, could that also mean uh, the sons of the foreigners? Well, the strangers are going to be the saints. So if you think of a stranger in the time of old, right? Like yeah. Ruth. Like Gentiles. Right? Yeah. Ruth was a Gentile. Gentile. She joined herself to Yahweh. Right? So her children would be accepted. Because but this is referring to the kingdom age. So the sons of the strangers are going to be the sons of the saints. These are the strangers that joined themselves to Yahweh. Okay, because I got very confused with my the ESV version because it has the foreigners. Yeah, the strangers is foreigners. The children, the children, the foreigners of the children. No, the it's children the, of the foreigners. children of the foreigners. And I have so, foreigners. if you think of it, Ed, we're not Jews, okay, right? Yeah, I'm not a Jew, so technically speaking, I wouldn't be allowed to go up to the temple in the same way that a Jew would be. But, however, if you're the son of somebody who has joined themselves to Yahweh, it's a different story. And it's a, this is a kingdom prophecy. It's looking forward to that kingdom age, right? They are going to be joined to Yahweh their children's sacrifices are going to be accepted. So just something to think about as we, as we look at those things. That's why we shouldn't worry about our children, where, where they, how they'll be taken care of. They will definitely they be will. taken care of. Because really, if you think about it, if the angel said to you, okay, um, I want you to go and I want you to leave your kids here, who of us is actually going to do that? I would forfeit my life for my kids. All of us would. You know what I mean? You wouldn't even think about it. There's no way you're going to say, well, okay, I'll go. Good luck on you guys. There's food in the fridge. You know what I mean? Like, you'd never do it, right? And that's never the way God has operated. You no. think of Noah's Ark. I mean, yeah, those are adult children. But nonetheless, they're not left behind. No. The only ones that are left behind are the ones who didn't want to borrow of it uh, in the day of Sodom, right? So we're coming on a cataclysmic time that's getting very close to that. And it's going to be a similar thing. Yes? Psalm 127, verse 3, children are inheritance of the Lord. Yes. You know, that's, uh, and uh, the fruit of the womb is his reward. Yeah. So there's no way, there's no way our kids there. are going to get lucky. You know? <coughs> yeah. And that's just something sometimes that gets asked. You know, like, it's thought about, well, what happens? I mean, I think the big thing is, is that we try and get our children to set their hearts to understand as soon as they can and to begin to chasten themselves, and then God will hear their prayers. You know, because people will say, well, when does God start listening to the prayers of kids? There's your answer at that point in time. Now, I mean, look at Daniel 10. The, the context here is slightly different, but you get the principle anyway out of that. Now, I just want to, in the time we have left, I want to look at the time period um, and the, the implications of this, okay? So, if we have judgment that's going to take place over a period of 10 years, from the blowing of the first trumpet to the blowing of the second trumpet, okay? I want to now jump into another time period. If you come to Revelation, chapter 17. <coughs> and let's read verses 12 down to... 14. Revelation 17, verses 12 to 14. And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which thou hast received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make the war, shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is the Lord of lords and king of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Okay, so again, we're talking about the time period of the ten kings. So this is, just to kind of extract out of this, you've got ten kings, which equal the ten horns. And if you go back to Daniel 2, you've got the ten toes, right? So this is Europe. 
Okay? And they give their strength and their power to the beast. Right? So you've got this European beast, and the nations of Europe all give their power and strength to this beast, which is ridden by the harlot system, the Catholic Church. Right? So we, we understand that symbology. How long do they give it there for? How long? What's the time period that's given in this passage? What does it say? One hour. Okay? So, one hour. Now, is yeah. that one hour in our timeline or theirs? It's a symbolic hour. Now, that's going to mess with your head a little bit. Um, this is a little complicated. This is God's way of looking at numbers, not algebra, the Arab from the Abbasid Empire. Okay, it works a little differently. Okay, one hour, which is the equivalent of how many hours are there in a day? 24. No, not according to Lord Jesus Christ. There's 12 hours in a day. So it's one twelve. Okay? Remember he says, are there not 12 hours in a day? He doesn't include the night, right? So the day period, if you go to the Middle East, it gets light at 6 o'clock, and guess what time it gets dark at? 6 o'clock, right? That's your day. So don't be sleeping until 9 or half it's over, right? So 1 hour equals a 12th, okay? How many months in a year? 12. Right. Six. One month equals a twelfth. Okay? So these are equivalents. How many days in a month? Thirty. Thirty days. Now, using your day for a year principle, you have thirty years. But what God does is He takes similar concepts, the twelfth and the twelfth, and he parallels them. Okay, that's the way biblical algebra works. It's different than the way math at school works, right? Because we would say you're taking the same principle twice, and we get all confused by it. But it works, because when you look at spirit or symbolic time periods in the book of Revelation, as we'll get into it, when there was silence in heaven for the space of half an hour, yeah. it was a 15-year period. When there was darkness or whatever it would be for an hour, it's a 30-year period. So, like, these are used throughout the apocalypse when it's in either the, the letters, not the letters, the, um, the seals, or the different time periods, right? So, why go into all that? The question is, if the horns give their power to the beast for an hour, right, how long does Europe survive for? 30, 30 years. years. So Europe Double 15, yeah. has 30 years. So this is the beast. A Revelation chapter 17 is going to have a 30 year time period. Okay. Now for those of you who are young, when I was your age and we were studying with Uncle Paul, back in Prince George, where there was dog sleds and log houses and all that kind of stuff, there was no European Union. Didn't exist, no. right? So 1991 came around and said they were going to have a, a united Europe with one monetary policy. We were all like, that's it, we're out of here, like, kingdom's coming because we can't be here, mm -hmm. right? And it's taken longer than what we thought it would to exist. But I got to go with Uncle John Ramsden, who some of you may have met over the years. Uh, one of the years I went to Britain to go to the Prophecy Day, and we went to uh, Brussels. Uncle John pulled a, a fast one on me and said, "We're going to." We went to the, the British Museum the year before, and this time he says, well, "Where do you want to go?" And I said, "I don't know." You know, and he says, "Well, I got an idea." So we ended up going to Brussels. We hopped on the channel, got up about five o'clock in the morning, got on the train, took the train underneath the ocean, crossed France, and we were in Brussels. And in Brussels is the home of the European Union, right? So we're standing in the, the Parliament building of the European Union, 
and there's all the seats there for the Parliament of the European Building, and outside is a woman riding a beast. It's a big metal statue they have there, yeah. and uh, and there you are inside the the actual place where the European Parliament now exists. And I said to Uncle John, I said, you know, I said this is kind of freaky. Because when I was looking at this like 10 years ago, it didn't exist. Now it's here. And this is probably the room where they're going to do exactly what it says in this verse here. These will make war with the Lamb. They're going to vote in this room to make war with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to overcome them because he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's the commander of commanders. But then you start thinking, well... Okay, that's a 30-year time period. So it's 30 years that that's all going to take place. Okay. So you go back and you say, well, what else has to take place before that Should really kicks into place? So is, like, are you putting this timeline above that timeline? Because the no, no, no. I, yeah, I know. I, 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 run out, I need a longer board. Okay. Oh, okay. So th this, is, this is just to kind of keep this period in mind. Okay, we're going to tack it on here. So what else do we know? What has to happen um, is Armageddon needs Armageddon, to take place, yeah. right? So before this, Russia. you have to have the Battle of Armageddon, however long that's going to be. Okay? And Armageddon is a battle, um, but it's more of a war, right? So when we talk about the Battle of Armageddon, it's not like a pitched battle that goes on for 12 hours and it's done. It's a war. It's a series of campaigns, and they go to the land. It's the March of the Rainbow Angel, right? right. But what has to happen before the March of the Rainbow Angel? And we remember? Go to Malachi. Right. How do we know that? Well, because it tells us that. Malachi, chapter 3. Chapter 4, sorry. And verse 5 and 6, whoever's next. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to, the, to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with the curse. So there's going to be an Elijah mission that's going to take place before the great and dreadful day of the Lord God Almighty. So before Armageddon, which is that great dreadful day, you need the Elijah mission. Right? Now who came in the spirit and the power of Elijah? John the Baptist. How long was John the Baptist's ministry? 30 years. 30 years. 30 years. Not 30. Three and a half years, right? Three and a half years is the mission of Elijah, right? The Elijah mission. If it follows the pattern, right? I'm just sort of, these are patterns. So before the Lord Jesus Christ came the first time, there was three and a half years of preaching to the Jews to prepare them to accept him as their Messiah, right? Then you have Armageddon. And during Armageddon, you have the Jews being taken captive, you have the city being overrun, you have them planting the tabernacles of their palace, you have them going down into Moab and into Ammon, and they escape down to there, the Jews do. They're looked after by the Arabs. So that's a period of time as well. So it's probably another three and a half years is my guess. But like this is just, it could be four, it could be two. But anyway, whatever it is, three and a half years there. Okay, so um, now you got to, Plug the. Uh, oh, by the way, the Elijah mission can't happen without what? Elijah. Elijah. Without the, without the resurrection. <laughs> right. There you go. Is Elijah going to be immortal before the rest of us? So the first set of horns have to be blown before the Elijah mission. Correct. So now we need to go back <coughs> ten good. years. You're getting there. That's good. Right. And here you have the first trumpet, which is the resurrection. So the resurrection is taking place 10 years prior to the Elijah mission, right? 
In this time period here, you've got the Elijah mission, then you've got Armageddon. It's about a 15-year period altogether. Um, from the point of resurrection and judgment, basically, memorialize it. Oh, but there's one year. Do you remember what happens when you got married under the law? Took a year off. Right, right. Yeah. there was a year. <laughs> Right? We're going to need it for all the fighting. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if they're reading around. Okay. So. <laughs> so, under the law of Moses, right, there was a year that if you got married, you were not allowed to go out to war. And it actually says that a man was to cheer his wife. So, you have the marriage supper of the Lamb that's going to take place, right? After 10 years of judgment, the trumpet blows, the second trumpet, the Day of Atonement, and then you would have the year of release, right? The sabbatical year that's going to take place from that point in time for a full year. Then you have the three and a half year Elijah mission. Then the Lord's ministry was three and a half years after that. So that's why I'm saying like this whole period here of redemption is probably three and a half years. And then after that... When the Lord sits upon the holy hill of Zion, that's when the beast really kicks it up a notch. And I'll give you the reason why. If you come to Psalm 2, actually, the, before we go to Psalm 2, let's just jump back to Revelation. Okay? Revelation chapter 14. They don't want to lose all those, ch those churches they got in Israel. Oh, they're going. I'm on that demo squad myself. <laughs> yes! <laughs> I got to join that. I did so now. I'm not of that. <laughs> Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Whoever's next. <clears throat> and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven, and earth, and the sea, and the fountains of waters. Okay, so there's another activity that needs to go on. This is, and notice it, it's the mid-heaven. It's between the heavens. What is that talking about? Well, we talked about this the other week, right? The heavens and the earth that are now, that are ruled over by Obama and Putin and all these other scallywags, right? That's going to go. And then a new heaven and a new earth is going to come along where it dwells righteousness, Christ and the saints. And in between that period, you have a proclamation. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come. Right? Worship the creator. No theistic evolution, all that nonsense. Worship the creator. Right? So... That's the time period before rebellion takes place. Yes, Ed? I'm just curious. During that little small period after the Armageddon, before the Beast of Europe, is for 30 years. Um, to what I have in my in the small print above me, in this uh, section, it states about three angels coming during that one year period to warn them of the Beast of Europe coming, in, in my understanding. Well, this is, this, is gonna, this is the beginning of the end, you could say, right? Mm -hmm. So come to the second psalm, because it tells you the response to this mid-heaven proclamation. So the angel goes out and says, Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Psalm 2 records for you the response of the nations. Now I'm just going to plug you into it. We're going to pick a couple of things out, because it's the same time period exactly. Have a look at... Um, Verse 6, right? Where we read there, God says, I've set my king on my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. Yahweh said unto me, Thou art my son this day, and I have I begotten thee. Right? So the decree is, I'm setting my king on the hill of Zion. Right? What are the nations supposed to do? He says in verse 10, Be wise now, therefore, ye kings, be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, rejoice with trembling, kiss the Son, lest he be angry and you perish from the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. So in Psalm 2, the mid heaven proclamation has gone on, and the nations are told to bow down to the Lord Jesus Christ. How do they respond? Well, take a look at verse 1. The nations rage, the people imagine the vain thing, the kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take 
counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. A chapter of that, was that in Two. verse 1 of Psalm? Yeah, second Psalm, verses 1 to 3. Right? So that's the response of the nations. So this is, this is Psalm 2. The nations are going to rebel, um, but it says there that God is going to have them in derision. In other words, he's going to laugh his head off at them. Um, because, like, how ridiculous is, is that? Like, they're, you're going to rebel against Almighty God and his Son, right? So he says you're going to bust them up like a clay pot with an iron, like a piece of, of rebar. Like, you think of a little Ming vase, you know, some nice little porcelain thing or whatever else, and you take a rebar crowbar or whatever it is to that thing and just smash it to pieces. That's about how strong the nations are really going to be when it comes to standing before God. But there's a twin or a 30 year period that these nations are going to fully give their power and strength to the beast, at the end of which they're completely and absolutely obliterated. Now, start doing the math. 30 years plus, let's say it's a year for rebellion. I mean, in some of this, I don't know exactly. Seven years here, so that's 38 years. Yeah, Another years. year or so here, 39 years. 49 years. Plus the 10 is another, you know, 49. 49. Interesting, what's the period of a jubilee? 49 to 50 years. Yeah. 49 on the 50th yeah. year, it's all over. Yeah. Now, when's the next jubilee come up? Soon, isn't it? Very soon. 2017? Think about it. It's 2018. 2017. 2017. Yeah. Right? Wow. So let's just leapfrog for a minute here. Let me just take a photo of this before I lose it. I just, and this is why I say, like, it's, there's implications that come out of this. I would not be, like, dogmatic on this and make you sign off on a statement that says you believe it or you're not that great red, Brantford. But, I mean, I think it's helpful to think some of these things through, right? And just sort of, like, let your mind follow through some of the facts that we're given. So if you were to just take this now and say, okay, let's look at the periods of jubilees, Right? Let's just follow along the jubilees that we know about, or some of them anyway. So let's go back in history. Let's start here, where we are today. We'll start, we'll put ourselves here. 2017. It's not today, but it's two years from now. Okay? That's the next jubilee. Why? Well, because 50 years before that, was 1967. No. What happened in 1967? Yes. The times of the Gentiles came to a close, the Six Day War. That's 50 years ago, just about. Okay? Well, what was before that 50 years? Well, it just happens to be 1917. During the First World War. What happened in there? It we almost finished in 1917. Um, the Ottoman Turks. Joined. Ottoman Turks ended, Jerusalem was captured, right? The end of the Ottoman Empire. So this is the Six Day War. And this was uh, Jerusalem. This is the Balfour Declaration. And it's the end of the Ottoman Turks. So what happened 50 years before that? Israel. Not quite. That's close. What would it be, Dad? 1917 minus 50. 47. What did you say? Minus 50. 19, 1917. 1917. 67. What book was written then? About Brother Thomas. Alphys Israel. Eureka. Eureka, was it? Yeah, yeah. Alphys came before, didn't it? Alphys is 1948, because there's a parallel one. Yeah. 1948, right? 1898, which was the first Zionist Congress. Yeah. 1948, which is the State of Israel. Right? You've got, you've got another parallel jubilee. But the point is, if you follow this through, right, and you say, okay, 2017, if we follow the pattern of jubilees, the next great event is 2067. 2067. The second advent. 
And right? hopefully by then the kingdom is here and we have our... All of this would fit quite nicely right there. into that little time period right there. That's just too long. Which would mean... <laughs> <laughs> okay, hold on Mom, a minute here. Mom, you're going to be dead by then. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> Josiah, <laughs> we're going to be immortal by then. By that by the time, you, you'll be really old, but we'll be all young and beautiful. Young and young and young. <laughs> and you'll be all wrinkled. Here we go. Ed is on the ball. Okay, hold on a minute here. So just look at this now and just do the math, okay? So if you, if you follow this pattern through, this point here around the 2017 period, if you plug this and say that at this point in time needs to begin what? Resurrection and judgment. That's 2017. We are 15 right now in November. So you have 2015, 16, 17. November happens to be Next when the year. Balfour Declaration took place, it was on November the 2nd that the Balfour Declaration was signed on Charlene's birthday. And then basically on December the 2nd, I think, or 4th maybe, a month later, is when Allenby walked into Jerusalem. So just when you're looking at this, and Uncle Paul was talking about how exciting it is, the time period we live in, right? Witnessing it. Like, look at it. Like, I mean, if you take these patterns of years that we've been looking at, and you say, okay, well, really, that plugs into there almost perfectly. This year here, 1967, you had, what was his name? Bishop Newton predict that date in the year 1754. He turned around and he said, that's the time that the Jews will have to possess the land again. Because the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled. And that actually fits another time, prophetic time period that goes all the way back to the Battle of Issus in 333 BC, which was the 2400 years, right? So all these time periods all kind of converge, and we get to this point, and it's all built on this, this trumpet period. The trumpet sounds, the gathering of the saints together, 10 years later the trumpet sounds, you've got the Day of Atonement when we're made immortal. During that period of 10 years is when the judgment is. How exactly that all works out, I don't know. Um, that hasn't been revealed. God, but the point God, is, God knows the beginning we are right in the end game. This is it. We're at the very, very end of time. Because I don't think that the Christadelphian community would saw it survive if we had to go 50 years more, let alone the state of Israel with all the flaming Arabs running around killing everybody off, right? I mean, it's just the way the world is today cannot survive 50 years, right? It would be a disaster by then. And of course, we know that the Lord Jesus Christ is at the door. Now, add to that the 7,000-year plan. This is into day 6, or day 7. Day 7. Right? We're into day 7. Yeah, we are. We're at the very beginning of it. And what's really interesting was the last thing. Last little note, okay? Come back to um, Joshua. <coughs> And these are just all little indicators that are very interesting to look at. Okay? Remember Joshua fought the Battle of Jericho? Okay. We're going to parachute in on Joshua, fighting the Battle of Jericho. Okay? Joshua, chapter, where are we here? Six. Now, pick up the symbology of this. Joshua chapter 6. Jericho is shut up in verse 1. It is a fortified city, kind of like Babylon the Great, right? Very similar, okay? Notice there that they're walking around the city. What do they have with them? What are they carrying with them? Trumpets. They're carrying trumpets, right? How many times do they go around the city? Seven times. Seven. Seven. The seventh time is seven. 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 So how many times do they go around? Forty-nine times. Thirteen. Thirteen. It's a trick question. Five. Six days and then yeah. seven on the seventh day. Mm -hmm. So that's the thirteen. Yeah. How many tribes were there? Thirteen yeah. tribes, right? Because you got to include Levi, right? But anyway, um, they go around seven days though around the city. 
seven days. On the seventh day, they go around seven times, right? So let's jump in on the beginning of the seventh day. So this is verse 15. So who is next? Uh, who do we get up to? It's either me or Judah. I think it's Lori. Okay. So Judges, or sorry, Joshua chapter 6, verses 15 and 16. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early, about the dawning of the day, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day only, they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened, when the priests blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Okay, now listen. Listen to the words. I want you to pick out the elements. What do they do very early on the seventh day? Rise up. Rise up. They rise. Okay. Then what happens? What other elements are there? What do you just tell them to do? March around the city. March. Okay. But what else? What's the sounds? The trumpet. You got a trumpet. What else? What are they supposed to do? Shout for the Lord. Shout. Okay. You've got shouting, you've got a trumpet, and you've got a resurrection. What are we missing? Thessalonians. Right? The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Shout. The shout. Yeah. With what then? The voice of an archangel. And the trump of God. What are we missing? Archangel. Where is he? He's there. Take a look at the previous chapter. Joshua? Joshua chapter 5. Right? Verse 13. Where they come along to Jericho and they see somebody standing there. And he's got a sword in his hand. Right? And he's got a sword that's drawn. Right? And Joshua asks that question. He says, are you on our side or their side? And the guy says, no. What do you mean no? You know, but that's what God says. It's not a question of, uh, are you on my, am I on your side? Are you on my side is the issue. But what does he say his name is? What does he say his rank is, I should say? Commander of the Lord's army. He's commander of the Lord's army, of his host. He is the archangel. So you've got the archangel and his voice. You've got the shout. You've got the trumpet. And you've got the resurrection taking place. Okay. All the elements that we've been talking about here. Now notice, when they go into the city, what are they to consecrate to God? <coughs> Verse 19. Of chapter 6. Of chapter 6. Mom, you want to read it for us? Verse 19. But all the silver and gold and vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto Yahweh. They shall come into the treasury of Yahweh. Yeah. So what is there? Gold? Silver, and bronze, brass, bronze. and iron. Where have you heard those before? Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar's image. Yay. They are consecrating the fall of Jericho to Yahweh. And it happens with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, with the shout. And it's very early in the morning that they rise up at the dawn of the seventh day. Guess where we happen to live? The at the, the dawn day. of the seventh day, because yes. we're 2017. We're already into the seventh millennium. Yeah. That's when Great Babylon, typified by Jericho, is taken. And the city falls, right? The walls fall. And the, the, and the same material that's used in this chapter is it not also used for the statue of Babylon? That's the one. Nebuchadnezzar's image, right? So all those pieces all come together. But again, this is just another time period to let us realize we're living on borrowed time. So the exhortation to us is put your houses in order. You know, pull your socks up, however you want to put it. Get your lives in order because the Lord is at the door. We're living at the absolute end of the times of the Gentiles. They're finished. The Lord is about to return. The iron chariots are about to come back down to Egypt. Yeah. Yeah, sure. that was in our, our on the weekend comments about Egypt, land of iron. Yep. It, it, if we don't pick up on these things when they flash by us, we miss the whole picture. Absolutely. 
Okay, I think we will end there.